Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter tonight. Uh, Todd Halamka is a practicing architect and founder of Todd Halamka and Partners in downtown Chicago. Uh, his practice focuses on three core domestic and overseas markets, universities, corporate headquarters office and office mixed use, and hotels. He and his wife, Susan, who's also tuning in tonight, have three grown children and they reside in Western Springs, Illinois in Southwest Cook County along the BNSF Railway's former Burlington Triple Track Speedway. Todd is an avid outdoorsman. He loves to travel, hike, fly fish and commune with nature, preferably within eye and earshot of a nearby railroad. His focus on railroad photography began in 2011, <clears throat> combining his lifelong love of trains and fascination with image making. Now, I first saw Todd's work in 2012 when he took second prize in our Johnny Gruber Creative Photography Awards program that year. We started corresponding soon after that. And I have to say, I was really taken by Todd's approach to photography. Uh, he came to photography later in life, at least railroad photography, as, uh, as we mentioned here. And I think partly because of that, he came unencumbered from so many of uh, the tropes and, uh, and ideas about how best to photograph trains that, that, uh, that afflict many of us. So I really felt that Todd had a, a really fresh and interesting and engaging approach of how to portray the railroad environment. And it has been a delight to see more of that, uh, to learn from him uh, and to see how he has engaged with his architect's eye for design and form in the photographic medium. And it's really a treat to get to hear him talk about that as he's going to do tonight. Uh, in the meantime, we've become great friends and had some wonderful trips together out along the Mississippi River photographing trains and elsewhere. And we look forward to many more of those in the future. Uh, so won't you please join me tonight in giving a very warm virtual welcome to Todd Halamka. Thanks, Scott. Um, let me maneuver. Let me know when you can see the screen. There it is. All right. And then I have to move one more piece over to here. And can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Um, and I'm going to take that down. OK. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for the kind words. Good evening. I first want to thank the Center for this opportunity to share some of my work. The following images combine a lifelong interest in nature, hiking, fly fishing cities, and a passionate love of trains. My railroad photography began in 2011, meeting the Center, Scott, and many of you at conversations that year. You can also look at a larger collection of my work by visiting my railroad photography website www.todd-halamka-railroad-photography.com. My presentation is organized in three sections, my image making process, natural landscapes, and urban landscapes. A few years ago, I had the privilege to put together some articles for Trains Magazine describing my approach, and the next few images illustrate this process. I employ the principles of line, shape, and form to visually layer images with foreground, midground, and background elements. In this view of Haider Pasha passenger yard in Istanbul, Turkey, the sweeping curve of the departing train provides the image's structure and establishes the midground layer, label two, and is defined by the two curved lines that move through the scene. In this case, the curved lines serve to counterbalance both the foreground shapes of the parked engine and shed roof, label one, with the background forms of the stage trains and engine house counterpoints, label three. The visual movement of the curved line and the train from bottom left to upper right sets up a contrapuntal movement from one to three. I, found the, I find the foundation of a good image moves the eye from front to back, left to right. The platforms of Munich Main Station form the basis of this image's structure as four separate trains are moments from departure. Line forms the framework reference to the vertical and horizontal. The red engine, label one, defines the foreground and shape, while trains, labels two and three, define the central form for the midground and background. Another personal preference is to bring the camera low and close to the foreground subject to permit the viewer to feel the immense scale of trains in a more intimate way. 
Trains speak to us on many levels, not only from their size, but also from their movement, color, texture, shape, and form, to name just a few. Photography is a means to celebrate and explore their power, presence, and place in our day-to-day -day lives. This image of a CSX freight moving through downtown Indianapolis explores scale and juxtaposition. The GE locomotive is passing eastward at late afternoon, label one, providing a detailed foreground shape while approaching the midground signal bridge, label two. The signal bridge directs the rail bed diagonal lines from image front to back and frames the background power plant focal point, label three. Again, I like the idea of organizing the picture frame with lines, shape, and form through the layering of foreground, midground, and background. The first three examples look at this strategy in a larger exterior setting. The same approach can be employed at a smaller scale as in the next example. The story of this image revolves around family as travelers board a cross-country train in Mumbai, India. Having people populate your photographs can add a wonderful and fascinating dimension to your story. Look for visually compelling scenes with people and break out your camera and explore. In this image, the interesting collection of baggage carts caught my eye, following, followed by the gathering families boarding the overnight train beyond. The image is first organized by the series of staggered carts that create a strong diagonal line, label one, moving the viewer's eye from front to back. The focal point and mid-ground element of this shot is the sitting grandmother, label two, anchored in turn by the train itself, the backdrop to the image, label three. I also like the role the supporting people play in the image, the family with luggage balanced on one of the member's heads, the boy aboard the train reading in the doorway, and the young man to the far left with his tall bottle of cold water lifted to his brow reminding me of the 100 degree, 100% 100 humidity of that summer day in Mumbai. Now let's explore more singularly focused subject matter with tighter framing and at a closer range. A pair of locomotives the morning after a long night's battle through deep snow forms the story of this image, endurance. Railroads never sleep and seldom stop for weather. They are 24 seven, 365 day per year machines, providing us with great opportunities to capture their never ending battle with mother nature. What intrigued me first was the combination of colors, the blue sky, the faded reds of the lead locomotive and the deep white snow the morning after an overnight storm. The engine provides the central focal point, label one. Note how the strong vertical lines of the telephone poles, label two, root the locomotive to the scene and how the poles calibrate the photograph from left to right. Remember, you don't need to see the entire poles to complete the mental picture. This left to right scaling also provides for discrete focal points, label three boxes, that focus on the story of the deep snow. The same parameters of lines, shapes, and form apply to this 1940s era steam locomotive in Moscow, Russia, but now at a close up level. The large oval shape, label one, of the boiler forms the central focus of the image and is organized by two quarter view lines, label two, that orient the perspective of the scene diagonally. In this image, I'm trying to balance the sun from a backlighted edge grazing angle to my right, while attempting to bring the diagonal movement of the white railing through the image from upper left to lower center. The counterpoint of the small oval of the headlamp, label three, provides an opposing diagonal offset to the grab bar and frames the myriad bolts, nuts, and metal plates that are my favorite parts of this image. A wheel of an SD70M locomotive celebrates the story of winter's onset. In this image, a simple combination of circle, line, and focal point tell the story. First, the horizontal line of the rail, label one, has an intimate discussion with the wheel, label two. Remember, you do not need to see all of the pieces to tell a story. In this case, only a part of the wheel is necessary and is held in space by the radius point at the axle. The story is then completed with the snow and spray of ice on the wheel, label three. 
This series of images is an, is an example of my interest in sequential overlay. A unit oil train approaches Makva Viaduct on a brutally cold Russian morning. The resulting image with a sequential overlay in layered transparency from front to back. I like to explore the ideas of movement through still imagery in different ways. Sunset along Naperville Curve captures a westbound Santa Fe passing a signal stopped westbound manifest on the central track, while an eastbound BNSF frames the left portion of this seven image sequential overlay. Returning at sunset a year later, now exploring a five image overlay of the westbound California Zephyr. A collage of Union Pacific images of mine along the Indiana Harbor Belt in LaGrange Park, Illinois. I enjoy looking at elements of trains in elevation. This image overlays front, side, and detail views as foreground, midground, and background. Here in a more abstract presentation, a four track crossing gate in four layers. Waiting on an adjacent platform for an evening metropolitan train home, an opportunity presented itself to capture three adjacent trains whose loading doors aligned providing a layered visual portal to the boarding passengers. The resulting combined matrix of individual images tells the story. My friend and photographer, Dennis Livesley recently said, our phone will become our primary camera moving forward. Although I would like to think not, I believe we will continue to head in that direction. My primary Camera equipment is a pair of Canon 5D Mark III in three lenses, a Canon 24 to 105 wide angle zoom, a Canon 24 to 200 zoom, and a Sigma 1 to 400 millimeter zoom. I enjoy the flexibility of these zooms and the budgetary restraint of not needing another bag of primes to achieve the same flexibility. I use a Gitzel reporter tripod from the 1960s capped with an Arca Swiss Cube tripod head. For extended photography trips, I will also rent a high resolution 300 or 400 millimeter super telephoto lens. This black and white image was taken with my iPhone of a passing Metra train and the reflected images of the passengers on my train. The image took seconds to make and is some 40 pounds less than my usual kit referenced above. Perhaps Dennis has a point. This image is a tribute to my late grandfather, Otto, who introduced me to my love of trains on this platform in Congress Park, Illinois, as a young boy. Memorable still is this clear straight stretch of several miles of mainline east, permitting visitors to scope approaching trains off the horizon. In 1941, my grandfather filmed the westbound Denver Zephyr already north of 100 miles per hour. In 2011, 70 years later, I returned to capture the westbound California Zephyr from the very same location. In this case, I have watercolor filtered his eight millimeter film clip into a still image as faded backdrop, while the 90 year old whistle post in the foreground physically connects our story. The following two sections look at a small sample of my first 10 years of railroad photography in generally chronological order or geographic grouping for specific emphasis. Please enjoy the journey. My railroad photography focuses on making images that speak contextually of time and place and explore how qualities of light and composition elicit emotion. As I was setting up for a sunrise shoot in the Tehachapi Mountains in 2013, an eastbound freight traveled through the loop before any sunlight reached into the canyon. A few minutes later from my hilltop lookout, I happened to turn 180 degrees and capture the tail end DPUs shoving uphill into the very first rays of sunlight. A forest fire smog creates a magical layering of diffused light and shadows 
as a westbound coal drag climbs the western Tehachapi Range. Sunset was 10 minutes earlier as a thunderstorm lifts above West Malta, Illinois, a 25 square mile patch of Midwest farmland with an eastbound UP stack train holding for traffic ahead to clear on its way to Proviso Yard, 70 miles to the east. 60 seconds from sunset, a westbound Z train waits for an eastbound manifest to pass near Mojave, California. It's interesting to me how we remember making certain photographs. I ran with my tripod and camera about a half mile to capture this image. Moments later, all was dark. Pacing an eastbound Z train leaving Bakersfield, California through the orange groves at 60 miles per hour in the back of Mike Johansson's Toyota truck. A morning image of a westbound stack train headed toward Bakersfield, California, along the western edge of the Tehachapi Range. An early exploration and continued interest of mine is shooting into the sun. My storytelling intention for this image was not only to capture the train just emerging from Tehachapi Tunnel 5, the third UP unit starved for oxygen was a bonus, but I was also intrigued with the composition of the switchback ranch road and foreground fence post in silhouette, a remnant of the 1980s earthquake that left the rancher's barbed wire fence still strung tight but now floating and spanning the 250 foot deep chasm below. Morning view at an overlook of the Mississippi River near Stoddard, Wisconsin. The river is over a mile wide in this location. The foreground BNSF stack train is complemented by the 100 car Canadian Pacific coal train just legible on the opposite shore. An eastbound stack train plows the West Malta, Illinois cornfields. This prototypical Midwest farming region extends flat as a pancake from horizon to horizon. A southbound BNSF unit coal train appears on the horizon near Litchfield, Illinois, north of St. Louis, Missouri. I really enjoy exploring the outer limits of defining a train within a scene. In this case, the snow flattened cornfields reveal a horizon punctuated by cathedral like barns and the approaching train kicking up plumes of exhaust and dirt. For this image, I'm clinging to the edge of a black volcanic rock mountaintop 100 miles northwest of Salt Lake City, Utah. After three hours of cold, unrelenting thunderstorms, packing 40 mile per hour winds, and nightfall around the corner, my tripod weighted with rocks and my camera wrapped under wind slapped garbage bags. An eastbound stack train finally approaches across a glistening Bonneville salt flats. A crazy way to spend a Saturday afternoon to some, a soggy but pure joy for me. A return to the same cliff's edge at 4 a.m., now looking east towards Salt Lake City across the Great Salt Lake as a westbound traverses the zigzag lake alignment and an eastbound waits in the foreground on a siding. A couple of hours later and just before sunrise, an eastbound bracketed by DPUs in the foreground begins its journey across the Great Salt Lake. A mile climb to Brady's Bluff Overlook in Perot State Park near Trempolo, Wisconsin. Hoping for a sunset that never materializes, a storm approaches while an eastbound notches wide open out of Winona, Minnesota on the horizon. The rear DPU-9 smoking into the evening sky as thousands of tiny hatching insects create a summer symphony above my head. A mile back trail climb near Glenhaven, Wisconsin. Scott Lotus shared this location with me back in 2014 after I was inspired by a beautiful winter image he made from the same location. This rock outcropping, several hundred feet above the Mississippi River, is as close to what the native eagles and hawks experience, as during my several hour perch, many came within 20 or 25 feet of me, curious as to who was this foreign visitor. 
a favorite Mississippi Palisades image of mine at sunrise atop Sentinel Rock as an eastbound slides downstream. Sometimes the light, the season, and the weather is perfect, and the only thing missing is a train. After nearly three hours of quiet contemplation, a lone track inspection vehicle plies eastward through the Mississippi Palisades. And then occasionally the waiting yields a reward as a westbound unit oil train led by a Southern Railways Norfolk Southern Heritage unit eases through the Mississippi Palisades 15 minutes before sunset. I returned this February for a river level winter view of an eastbound stack train. Sentinel Rock is visible in the upper right. An hour drive south of Lexington, an eastbound steel coil train from Gary, Indiana crosses High Bridge spanning the Kentucky River. And sometimes you find an unexpected intrusion within the landscape. At River's Edge, a winterized steamboat's headhouse provides another high bridge image opportunity. The bridge stands 1,659 feet long, 283 feet high above the river. And eastbound crosses the Kentucky River at sunset. In January of 2015, I visited the New River Gorge in West Virginia for two days and three nights to explore some of the last remaining coal traffic through magnificent West Virginia scenery, inspired by a number of very talented photographers who've captured the region poetically over the years, including Scott, Travis, and Chase, as well as the seminal work of Kevin Scanlon. I set out in the depths of winter for a below zero saga of West Virginia mountain railroading. This composite image of Hawk's Nest Overlook comprises seven five minute exposures of a westbound empty coal train moving at 10 miles per hour after sunset on the left half of the image. The right half of the image captures a loaded eastbound coal train just before sunset the following day. I like exploring multiple images from the same location over different times and seasons and occasionally juxtaposing them to tell a story. The eastbound Cardinal winds its way through the New River Gorge on track one, seen from the eastern terminus of the Endless Wall Trail. Also from the Endless Wall Trail, an eastbound loaded coal train crawls upstream on track two. As late afternoon's long shadows blanket the gorge, a westbound empty coal train descends the canyon along track two an uncommon sight as westbound trains typically ride track one. Moments later, the same westbound winding through a rising fog at water's edge. Sunset at Hawk's Nest Overlook as an eastbound loaded coal drag inches past Hawk's Nest Dam nearly 600 feet below. Pre-dawn at Hawk's Nest Overlook an hour before sunrise as an eastbound feels its way through the early morning light. I recommend staying at Hawk's Nest Lodge, a 1950s era preserved pleasure and only a 10 minute drive from the Overlook. Also memorable was their nightly chili, cheese sandwiches and hot coffee to thaw a sub-zero body. Pre-sunrise at Perot State Park near Trempolo, Wisconsin as a BNSF manifest heads west in the dead of winter. Cosnino Ranch, 20 miles outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, offers beautiful and rugged desert scenes. Here I explore quartering late day sunlight and its high contrast opportunities, a westbound unit oil train head end, the same westbound tail end DPU. I returned that evening just after midnight for a long eight minute exposure under a three quarter full moon. The westbound California Zephyr climbs into Big Ten curves after leaving Denver, Colorado 20 minutes earlier as an incoming storm dapples sunlight through the valley floor below. 
The 6 a.m. daily westbound manifest out of Denver starting to climb the Flatiron Range. The California Zephyr at Big Ten Curves headed toward its namesake with the skyline of Denver in silhouette beyond. In early morning, eastbound Coltrain descends the Rockies. A mile hike locates this spot halfway up Big Ten Curves. Two locomotives on the point, three mid-train helpers, and one tail end DPU just legible to the upper left of this image. The mid train power. The tail end DPU. A westbound ballast train waiting at Rocky Siding for the descending coal train to clear now heads up Blue Mountain and into the Rockies on its way to Moffett Tunnel. Two hours later, an empty coal train heads past Blue Mountain and up into the Flatiron Range. Many have summited the Flatiron Range in Colorado to embrace the historic Moffett route through the Rockies, perhaps few as poetically as Mel Patrick. In this image, I retrace a route of Mel's some 50 years later and capture the westbound California Zephyr on a beautiful spring morning. Returning to the Tehachapi Mountains, a westbound UP stack train approaches way long, an hour before sunset. An early morning breeze pushes across the central range as an eastbound emerges from Tunnel 10 below. Sunrise DPUs push the stern of a unit grain train out of the Mojave Desert and up into the Tehachapi Mountains. West of Bealeville and eastbound enters Tunnel 2. A UP manifest heads through Rodeo Canyon. Sunset near Bealeville. An eastbound manifest at Monolith. A morning westbound in the eastern range. A westbound Indiana Railroad stack train navigates Tulip Trestle in southern Indiana. A second visit yields another westbound stack train from below Tulip Trestle. I also like to look at images in black and white where contrast, tone, and light offer a different mood and feel. A January sunrise paints a westbound coal train head to tail east of Rogan, Colorado. Another westbound coal drag lifts and falls across the Colorado High Plains. On this late morning January image, a westbound stack train approaches the Rockies. Mount Vernon, Iowa. This image recalls my Midwestern farm region roots, where once upon a time, the trains that passed by this ancient barn were cattle, pig, corn, grain, local consists. Today, the setting remains nearly the same, but the trains are now coast to coast, nonstop consists, predominantly composed of overseas containers. Two years after my photograph on August 10th, 2020, an extraordinary weather event called a derecho, packing 140 mile per hour winds, obliterated the 190 year old barn. Nothing was left. Cisco Bridges near Lytton, British Columbia. I try to take an annual winter trip somewhere in the world to explore railroading of that region, typically in the dead of winter, when the air is clear, the leaves are down, and the greatest contrast of steam and exhaust are amplified by the cold. I try to also travel with another railroad photographer on these remote excursions for the camaraderie and safety. This trip was made with my friend, Marie Boschlicker. Cisco bridges from a mile south of the previous image, now from a wide angle panoramic view of a westbound coal train. The mid-train DPU 
is crossing the bridge beyond while the tail end DPU are just legible on the horizon. Hell's Gate Chasm, just after climbing down several miles of backcountry at day's end, snake bit with not a single train, a distant horn echoes through the canyon. I sprint a half mile back up the trail to capture an eastbound oil train. Moments later, a snow squall turned the scene to whiteout conditions. We later learned a nearby rock slide closed the line and took hours to clear, a common occurrence along the Fraser River route. Black Canyon, British Columbia, as a winter storm greets an eastbound CN stack train. A several mile hike across ranch land locates this spot. An hour before sunrise, an eastbound unit oil train crosses the Wisconsin River as it merges with the Mississippi from Pikes Peak State Park, Iowa. The falls of the Ohio fossil beds in late August as a northbound CSX auto track leaves Kentucky and enters southern Indiana. I revisited the falls just two weeks ago to find the fossil beds submerged by heavy spring rains below four feet of 20 knot water rushing downstream. Another memorable winter trip was my first visit to the Powder River Basin, Wyoming in 2016. Here a loaded southbound unit coal train works its way through miles of Wyoming ranch land. Sunrise ranch land south of Bill, Wyoming. The drag shovel seen in the background center is nearly 20 stories tall. The two railroads serving the Powder River Basin sit side by side after running through the flood loading loop seen beyond. Morning rush hour with bumper to bumper traffic. I didn't see another vehicle for several hours this particular morning, permitting this center of road vantage point. A loaded coal train rides the main line north at Converse Curves. Nearing sunset, a loaded northbound pushes hard at 50 miles per hour on the horizon, while an empty backs into a mine for a refill in the foreground. Gillette, Wyoming, sunset, moonrise. Two distinct memories stay with me from this visit. The bone chilling, steady 30 to 40 mile per hour winds atop 10 to 20 degree temperatures, and the extraordinary panoramic views typically extending 50 to 75 miles. Sunrise, Thunder Basin National Grassland. To my mind, urban landscapes offer some of the same opportunities of scale, context, and storytelling of natural landscapes. But now the narrative is shaped by constructed, man-made interventions the railroad interacts with. An eastbound BNSF freight approaches at sunset along the triple track speedway in Hinsdale, Illinois. To me, the trees and buildings become a canyon framing a flowing river of rails. A remnant backwater rust belt swamp in East Gary, Indiana becomes an interesting collage of man and nature. Sunset East Ox, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Orvieto, Italy, seen from the medieval castle above the modern city as a bullet train passes at 150 miles per hour. Much of my work as an architect has taken me around the world and I try to never leave home without my camera. The main station and yard in Munich, Germany at minus 30 degrees. A favorite European location of mine, the yard and station seem to never sleep and function much like a city within the city. The passenger train yard in Munich is a canvas of movement registered across a forest of steel trees and wires. The station possesses a mechanical-like rhythm of more than 100 passenger trains per day that move like reptiles through the forest. 5 a.m. Munich Main Station staging yards. Hundreds of trains head to and from Victoria Station, passing through Dobigat in Mumbai, India. The city provides a fascinating canvas for urban landscapes depicting both growth and decay. 
Victoria Station is the main passenger rail terminus in Mumbai. Note the large eyebrows on the head ends for shedding the heavy monsoon rains. Victoria Station coachyards. As monsoon season begins, the yard turns a lush green. Moscow, Russia also presents extraordinary urban landscape image opportunities that celebrate the city's heavy utilization of passenger and freight rail transportation combined with its unique climate and exaggerated low sunlight variations. An industrial neighborhood awakens at 4 a.m. near Platform Zill, Moscow. Like razor wire briar bushes along farm fields of steel rails, Kivesky West Terminal Yard in Moscow at sunrise. Coal is still burned in passenger coaches for heat, illustrated in this twilight image over Kavesky engine house sheds. A 20 degree below zero winter morning at Kavesky Terminal. Fourth Bridge, South Queensbury, Scotland, spring. The inner city East Coast, now operated by Virgin, heads across the mile long Fourth Bridge toward Edinburgh on its way southward journey to London. A southbound local train proceeds across Fourth Bridge from North Queens Ferry in this early evening image. For those interested in a visit, there's a wonderful bed and breakfast in North Queensbury, including a restaurant and pub located nearly under the northernmost span, where I reserved a room on the second floor dormer overlooking the bridge and harbor. It was very hard to sleep, however, with my camera and tripod craning through the open dormer, focused on the ever-changing fog to moon to storm theater outside my window. Istanbul, Turkey has two primary terminals, one on each side of the Bosphorus. This image is from Haider Pasha Terminal in East Istanbul, where a modern city envelops an early 1920s rail yard infrastructure. You may recall this image from my earlier process section. Haider Pasha diesel house sheds as an ancient diesel prepares to leave for work in the yard. Figuratively, I look at interior spaces as another form of urban landscapes. I often work in wide angle, vertical format, as in this image and the next. Haider Pasha electric house sheds, again working in wide angle, vertical format, I'm trying to capture the spatial dimensions of the shed's heroic sawtooth roofs, cascading light down onto the trains and repair equipment. Serkechi Terminal in West Istanbul, Turkey, where 1940 and 1950s diesel and electric equipment work side by side with new train sets from 2012. A three week winter trip in 2018 to Northwest China along the Mongolian border and the old Silk Road. I set out to capture the last active steam locomotives in revenue service on earth. Travis DeWitts joined me on this adventure. We photographed 16 hours a day and night for more than two weeks where daytime temperatures hovered below freezing and the smell of the 20 mile long coal mine permeated our souls. Pre-dawn, Sandaling, China, February 2018. For this image, I'm standing 50 yards back from the scene, employing a 300 millimeter super telephoto lens at F10, ISO 1000, 0.8 of a second on a tripod. Beyond, a loaded coal train leaves the blue loader and begins the slow ascent to the top of the mine as another J-series locomotive backs into the loading area, Sandaling, China. A sub-zero evening captures another 24-7 coal train climbing up from the abyss at Sandaling Mine. A special thank you to our wonderful Chinese guide, June, recommended to us by friend Mike Valentine. Returning now to North America, a westbound Norfolk Southern road railer at LaGrange Park, Illinois, snowstorm. Nugent Sand barge to train loading docks along the Ohio River. Louisville, Kentucky. During my first year of railroad photography, I used an excellent compact Sony NEX series model that had a flip up LCD screen that I missed dearly with my higher end full frame Canon equipment. Consequently, 
I often lay down low to the ground to explore a different perspective of the subject matter at hand. Bedford Park, Illinois sunrise. Hellgate Bridge and inbound Acela racing a storm into New York City. A westbound Amtrak atop MacArthur Bridge Viaduct, St. Louis, Missouri. Oakland, California docks at sunset. East Garrett, Indiana. San Francisco, California. This image has many of the elements I look for in creating urban landscapes. A sunset light, a mid-ground element, in this case, a cluster of children coming home from school, disembarking from the trolley. The late sky reflecting in the trolley cab nose and the distant container ship headed to Asia. Now let's turn briefly to some urban landscapes in my hometown. Twice annually, the sunset aligns with the street grid of Chicago called Chicago Hinge. This 200 millimeter image of Michigan Avenue in the foreground stretches several miles west, capturing what I have fondly called my man-made mountain range of skyscrapers, defined by the loop elevated, seen here with trains along both Wabash Street in the foreground and Wells Street in the background, just after sunset. A northbound Wells Street L train at sunset. I really enjoy exploring scenes within the city that are essentially unnoticed places that offer a more intimate scale of urban setting. Here, a Metra train momentarily peeks through an opening as the L and Lake Street runs perpendicularly overhead. A Chicago Riverwalk view below LaSalle Street Bridge as a southbound elevated train crosses the double deck Well Street Bridge beyond. As the L defines its namesake downtown, Chicago's bascule bridges define its river. Chicago, Illinois Union Station. Having just arrived to the city via Metra, the morning after an overnight storm, spots a worker unclogging a floor drain. I make a habit of carrying a camera most days and every so often it pays off. Lake Street Elevated looking west. This image was made by extending out from a parking garage with outstretched torso and arms. I like the multi-layered description of context in this image. The forest of skyscrapers forming the canyon that frames the view the network of elevated tracks above the pedestrian and vehicular strata at grade level, and the stereo-like interplay of the slightly distorted reflected view of the same scene in the glass. A wet snow begins to fall on a southbound elevated Wabash Street train. The dark canyon of turn of the century buildings are illuminated for a split second as the third rail shoe arcs into the snow-filled sky. As you can see, I enjoy making images in inclement weather. I'm also interested in exploring the visual opportunities of the handheld pan, where the ordinary image of a traditional still frame is re-registered about a heightened focal point. In this case, the northbound train's driver and occupants, while everything else is rendered in a slightly blurred, dreamlike sequence. The north branch of the Chicago River as a westbound Lake Street elevated train forms a band of white light in the distance. The Chicago Merchandise Mart has recently installed a series of cinema lens projectors that present moving images across its facade. Here, two elevated trains cross the river as a dance scene unfolds beyond. The 12.30 a.m. departs Chicago, the last northbound Metro train of the evening, as it works its way under the former jointly owned Pennsylvania Railroad, Milwaukee Road position light signals. A view from Grant Park in 2011 demonstrates another important aspect of making images, recording the inevitable passing of time and change. The foreground elevated bi-level electric metro trains have since been scrapped and replaced. The Santa Fe headquarters sign removed from atop its former headquarters and Sears Tower beyond has been renamed and extensively remodeled. 
A recurring interest of mine is making images that bring Chicago's bridges, river, trains, and buildings together, expressing its unique attributes within a single frame. A North Branch Chicago River tour boat approaches with a westbound Lake Street elevated train beyond. Orlean Street Bridge, view looking east to a Well Street elevated train. Chicago's metro, regional, and cross-country passenger and freight network present a series of extraordinary photography opportunities I term thresholds to and from the city. The following series of images outline some of these thresholds. Roosevelt Street Bridge view north as a metro train backs into Union Station while another throttles to the southwest suburbs. Amtrak Engine House at 18th Street. Union Pacific's proviso yard with the skyline of Chicago beyond. Cicero Avenue Bridge and the Belt Railway of Chicago's hump yard as an early morning fog begins to lift. A BNSF stack notches out a Corwith yard to connect with the rest of its loads at Willow Springs five miles west, where it will become another Z to Los Angeles. Calumet River lift bridges, the Norfolk Southern Main Line threshold to the city. A recent winter trip to the two remaining active steel mills in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This image from the Edgar Thompson plant at sunset as the crew travels light to collect another load of hoppers. An approaching storm at sunset at the Ackler Middle Mill in Cleveland, Ohio. I find a great way to understand the urban structure of a city is to research and photograph its passenger stations and freight yards. By studying these rail networks, the resulting images begin to more fully describe that city's unique contextual story. The next several images look at the role stations play as fabric in the urban landscape. Javel RER station, Paris, France. Gardeleon staging yards, Paris, France. Main station, Frankfurt, Germany, image one of two. Main station, Frankfurt, Germany, image two of two. Main station, Prague, Czech Republic. Liverpool Street Station, London, England. King's Cross Station, London, England. Grand Central Station, New York City. The last four images are from a recent trip to Porto, Portugal, a coastal city topographically similar to San Francisco. Douro River Sunrise, Porto, as a unit coal train crosses the river beyond. Gustav Eiffel's laced iron railroad bridge built in 1877 in the foreground and the new concrete mainline bridge in the background, Porto, Portugal. Downtown Porto streetcar scene. River's Edge View, Porto, Portugal. Finally, another aspect of my railroad image making process has been an exploration of still images in sequence and how they trigger emotive chords and memory of a particular experience at a deeper level. What I like about this exploration is unlike video, movement in time can be compressed or extended to describe the context at hand in a more personal and abstract manner. I wanna leave you this evening with an eight minute selection of a few short sequences. The first is from the New River Gorge Endless Wall Trail in West Virginia, followed by a climb in the bluffs near Glen Haven, Wisconsin along the Mississippi River. The Great Salt Lake night and day, Hinsdale Highlands at daybreak, pre-dawn at Munich Main Station, and morning at West Malta, Illinois. Thank you.
Thanks for everybody's time. That was great, Todd. Wonderful to add those videos on. They added so much. No, spectacular work. And you know, in this in this era of, of mega railroads that seem to be homogenized and we think that everything out there tends to look the same, Todd, you remind us there's quite a lot of variety and beauty if you just know how to look for it. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us tonight. Anytime, it's a pleasure. Just remind everyone if you have any questions um, for Todd to send those in over the Q&A. We'll get through as many as we can. We do have one in Todd from uh, Mark Faust who shares his own uh, uh, misadventure of being out in a snowstorm and by the time the train finally got going and he got his picture of it, the road over the hill he had drove it in on was so uh, covered in snow that he couldn't get back home and had to take a very lengthy detour to do so. And he was just curious if you had uh, any uh, memorable misadventures you might want to share. Um... Let's see, coming back from Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, I left in a, and I had a four wheel drive truck, which I sadly no longer have, but uh, I left in a blizzard and drove about eight hours in that classic wipers full, see the end of the hood ornament and that's it. Pretty, pretty harrowing there, but uh, probably the only the only thing I regret, I, I do a lot of cold weather, uh, is having the right equipment and meaning the right clothing equipment and the layering. And I think I've mastered that at this point, but I got my hands pretty cold a few times that my hands kind of run cold all the time because they were pretty close to frostbite too many times. Mm -hmm. The hard part is learning how to use a camera and the controls in the super cold and getting a, a pair of gloves that actually you can feel all that you need to feel and be able to adjust. I shoot manually. Um, and I finally found a pair of being the fly fisherman, it would have dawned on me sooner, but it didn't. A pair of finger that fold back, you can fold back individual uh, fingers, but they're the only gloves I've ever found that you can actually dunk them in water, you know, below zero and so forth, and they stay warm. Mm, wow. I, use, I use those a lot. And I've tried heated gloves with batteries, all those things, and none of those work. I, I'm reminded of, I think it, there's the picture of the, the side rod uh, diesel switcher under the canopy, the vertical shot with the exhaust going up. And if I recall correctly, there was an interesting story about uh, someone you encountered there uh, yeah the my several years of doing work in in istanbul and ankara um i would wander typically you may wonder why i like early morning light and late dusk light or evening those are bracketed about 10 hour days of work in between with clients so those are the before meetings and after meetings are when i have access to go out so uh, and weekends so that recalls a time when I went wandering into, um, I usually wander into places without too much risk until someone stops me. And I was wandering one Sunday morning into the diesel house in uh, Istanbul and an elderly gentleman came up and we couldn't speak a word of, of language in our own native tongue. But he saw me photographing and he took me over to the engine and he'd been running that engine for probably 30 years. And he sort of motioned, I'm gonna start it up and go out into the yard, uh, get ready. And I had, I think still I had my Sony at that point. So I'm down in a grease pit on a nearby track and uh, down in the grease and I'm getting ready. And what I wasn't ready for was when he started it up, the smoke and the noise filled the whole space. And I almost fell over backwards into a big pile of ties, steadied myself. And I just got lucky and took that shot because it was just filling that whole building with smoke. And what I found interesting that I didn't capture in the picture is the smile on his face and how proud he was of that locomotive that was sort of his his life for the last several decades. And then he ran out into the yard and that was it, but came back a few more times. And probably on my third visit, uh, they invited me back into the back sheds where they have their tea and uh, sat down, had tea with them. 
and I took their picture and I came back about three months later for another trip and no one was there. And I wandered over into the electric house shed and I found some people there. Long story short, I came back a third trip and I had made some prints of them and I didn't see them again, but that was their day off. But I left them on the, uh, the master, uh, the uh, yard master's table uh, with a note. So hopefully they got them. Well, those are great connections. Um, well, Todd, I have a, a question kind of based off of one of our, uh, our attendees, a comment from attendee sent in, but how do you view kind of the future of railroad art in the terms of video? Um, reflecting on some of the, the clips that you shared with us? Um, I've never shot video. I, I really enjoy looking at it. Um, I think that, and it was a little hard with the Zoom. I think it was close to the right speed and so forth. But I, like I said earlier, I enjoy looking at still images in different ways that make one who interacts with it look at it a little bit differently. And again, with sequential either overlay or sequential in, in the last segment there. Um, I enjoy uh, capturing context, time of day, light, and movement. Um, and you, you're, everyone records sort of in their memory how uh, that experience evolved and in, in what you felt when you were there. And uh, I've probably and it's been a number of years since I've done a sequence like that, but I probably did about 200 of those. They're arduous in the thousands of images it takes to do just one of those. But what I enjoyed in the experience or the exploration is again, um, how it triggered, how I felt when I was there. And those that I, I like the most are those that sort of capture that that emotion uh, that's hard to describe in words, but basically, you know, you know, springtime, the last image we saw, or the last sequence in, in Malta, Illinois, the corn is just coming up. I filmed that area the last decade from when they're planting to, you know, when they're, when they're bringing in the corn to when they're turning it over again to the dead of winter. And it's those sort of memories and connections for me and exploring how you put them together in new ways. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure others have done this too, but I enjoy tinkering and thinking about it and then seeing how that relates to the experience and I hold on to it later. Mm -hmm. That's really struck me during the pandemic and, and you know, just being in the same place so much, you really appreciate the, the localized changes of seasons and even just one day to the next and, and seeing the, as you say, the new greens of spring come in and, and seeing that same view out your window, it's the same view, but it's different every day. And there's something I think really special to that. And, and I love seeing how you do capture that in your photography and it's something I love to play with as well. So it's really, and I think that's, I mean, I, I, as I go through our collections at the center, I'm always, I mean, we have so much phenomenal work, but I'm always, I think some of the most striking photographs I come across are the ones that that came from a photographer working very close to home who understood the rhythms of the railroad and the landscape and was able to to capture those and sort of that that deeper look and, and i think it's uh it's important that even as we travel all over the world that we we look closely as at our own in our own backyard and, and be able to photograph um that that local scene so so fully i think a, i think a good example that comes to mind not railroad photography but um a book i believe he was a native Wisconsinite that I want to say maybe 10 years ago published a book called Tree. Mm. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it struck a chord as you were talking, but he mm. took a picture of the same tree mm. for 365 days, one year, mm. and every day, no matter what the weather, whatever. And, you know, he didn't, didn't hold the same exact uh, location, but it's a fascinating book. I think it's called Tree, but like in the same to in, in support of what you said, it's amazing what you do see and what you don't see in something you visit often. Yes. And then every so often you'll see something that you never saw in that location. And that's part of the fun of discovery. I think I, I like that. I can, you know, trip over the same piece of sidewalk <laughs> 10 times and then all of a sudden notice something there, you know, along the railroad that I hadn't seen. 
Well, and that's one of the great things about travel too, is that, that you know, you, you travel and you see new places and you appreciate those. And then often that experience helps you appreciate your home area in new and different ways when you get back. Yeah. Now, well, speaking of travel, we, we did have another question come in, um, a little bit more of just a logistical question, but Todd, I mean, clearly you've traveled all over the world. Um, uh, do many of the places you, you go to in the yards and facilities, do you need to get permission ahead of time for a lot of the places you shoot or you seek out places that have, that have access? Uh, and domestically, um, I will sometimes try to write the yard master or I will always go to the yard master office before going out into any yard and ask for permission. Um, the big lines, you know, the, the, the major railroads, that's a harder thing to do unless you can write someone that gives you a pass and permission, which I've done much harder. It's the smaller short lines, branch lines, regionals, um, a good time to do that. And again, I recommend anyone listening, you do go to the yard master and ask permission. Uh, a good time to catch them is on a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, when they're not typically, you know, busy moving a lot of uh, trains and so forth. That's domestic, Haley. Um, overseas, it's hard because a lot of the places you don't have the native language. So I've wandered places probably a little bit more risk oriented, but tried to be safe. And then we'll talk without having the language with whoever I approach. Russia, for example, um pretty much leave you alone um more stories for another time there but i met a wonderful uh, engineer that took me back into some engine houses there uh, not unlike in istanbul um india fascinating to pretty much walk almost anywhere there was invited up a three generation family took me up into their switcher in dobi Ghat. Um, and they live on the engine, um, very resourceful, but uh, the whole engine basically held together inside the controls with duct tape, um, but still work in the yard every day. So varies, um, but the best bet is to try to communicate with someone and you know, make sure they know you're not there trespassing, but you're interested is in the art and in, in photography. Uh, but be careful, obviously yards are dangerous places. Well, yeah, just in being being respectful, I think, and it, it seems to me that railroaders the world over often take a great pride in their work, and and when they have the opportunity and feel like they they can, I think they love sharing it with other people who are interested in it. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. So, any travel plans for twenty twenty one then? <laughs> um, slowly but surely, we have one of our children we're proud of is, is getting married, and uh, there's some overseas plan there. Um, also, just, you know, there's so many wonderful places here in North America that are yet unexplored that um, so many things to do, so little time. So it's, it's a it's a uh, it's a tough question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I I very much want to go to the northern reaches of Japan uh, soon. Um, and if fortunate, uh, back to Chile and a few other areas that are on the bucket list, if you will. But right now, probably North America and continuing with sort of that winter trip, annual winter trip, um, mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest, and I'd love to get back toward California again. Well, I'm sure Scott can give you plenty of tips in northern yes. Japan. <laughs> yes, he happy can. to help as much as I can, although it's changed a lot since I was last there. Well, I, I like they have the new bullet train up the Hokkaido too, so you can get up there faster, which is good. Right, right. Uh, hmm. But yeah, a good question, Haley. Uh, I, there's about, I could go on for hours about where I want to go, but it's the question of when and how I get there. <laughs> I think that's the question we're all asking ourselves right now. <laughs> I just hope the world gets through the pandemic pandemic safely and then kind of recalibrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even though we're we're doing pretty well with vaccinations here, it seems like in other other countries are there's still a lot of a lot of uh, heartache and and suffering, and uh, we just yeah hope they can all move forward and we can all move out of this together. Yeah, and get back to some of these these incredible places. 
Well, Haley, I don't think we have any other open questions, although the, the accolades, Todd, have certainly been pouring in over the chat uh, since you wrapped up. Uh, really, uh, really, God, really I kind words. most people stunned. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a wonderful hobby for everybody to explore and enjoy, and it's never the same. I think that's part of what's exciting about it. So I encourage everybody to get out there and keep going. Thank everybody for your time tonight. Appreciate it. And Haley, uh, what, do, what do we have coming up next on the agenda? Uh, next on the agenda, we have um, a presentation on the Monon Railroad uh, social and environmental change along that line, I think from the 1960s to the present. Um, and that'll be coming up on June 8th. Um, and we will be sending out information about that on our social media and post the link for registrations when that opens on our website, um, hopefully in the next few weeks. So yeah, two tuned. weeks. Two weeks from the night. Okay, well, hopefully by the end of the week. <laughs> yes, right, right, right. <laughs> oh, well, Haley, thank you again for your, your great behind the scenes work and making these possible. Todd, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you for all you do for the center as a member of our board and, and a, such, a, such a diligent and, and passionate volunteer and, and a, a, I think a real visual leader of the organization. It's really, really a treat to, to work with you and, and get to share your work tonight. So, so thank you. Well, thanks again for being able to do uh, and share and, and participate with the board. Well, it's our it's our great pleasure and honor. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Again, I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director, and uh, we'll see you again in uh, just two weeks uh, for that uh, look at the Monon Railroad, Who's Your Lifelines, and we've got some more great programming coming up for you over the rest of the summer, and we're hoping maybe an in-person conference uh, in the fall, um, conditions permitting. Uh, stay tuned for more information about that coming soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good night. Stay safe. Good night. Bye-bye now.